I'm dialed in. We can hear each other. Mute the computer's mic. <laughs> Whoa. Did you hear like a bunch of sounds within sounds? Yeah, yeah. Echoes in and echoes. Okay, I think I think we're good now. Um, <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the echo chamber. <laughs> right. You got to be on LSD for this episode to make sense. <laughs> What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in my car. We'll be nice and quiet, and then we should be uh, should be cooking. There you are. We were wondering when you'd show up. Bipolar disorder is one of the most misunderstood and least well recognized of all mental illnesses. You are with us, or you are with the terrorists. There is a belief that bipolar disorder is linked to being gifted either in a creative sense or intellectual. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich! You know, many depression and bipolar disorder is a very morbid condition. Pick up the phone and These stop doctors by. here, they, they will be the first to say it is not something to take lightly. Yeah, right. It's about elevating that conversation to a national level. And bringing mental illness out of the shadows. We want to let people living with mental health challenges know that they are not alone. I'm going slightly mad. Self-destructive man feels completely alienated. Utterly alone. Utterly alone. He's an outsider. Why am I so difficult to I must be insane. If nothing else, I want to have created something real. Sporadic is my thoughts, come it's mind boggling. People were looking at me crazy on oh, Jimmy, Jimmy Kimmel. I said, I'm a creator genius. Right. Like, could you ain't supposed to say that. Supposed to say you that. You were diagnosed with bipolar disorder. How did you cope with that? You know, at first I was really angry. But then really happy, then furious, and then really cheered up. I'm so glad you're cured. You're bipolar. Wow, what does that mean? What's the cure? Medicine? Make me like them? Yeah, right. Am I a Martian? Depression. There's a real demon in the woods, too. A lot of creative people. Go to the craft service table, you get a cup of coffee. Robin Williams is sitting by himself. Totally depleted. Maybe our only option. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. Do it. No. Never give up. Change is gonna come. Never surrender. On my watch. Yes, it is. Uh, the consensus is I'm bipolar. A little funny in the head. What do you mean funny? Funny how? Oh. How am I funny? It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit. Keep moving forward. How much can take? They keep moving forward. They keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Ninety-nine percent of all new income is going to the top one percent. The top one tenth of one percent owns almost as much as the bottom ninety. Money in the head. Uh, I'm by winning. I win here and I win there. Gentlemen. Welcome. All right. I love I love being in the car because it's uh yeah that's I feel like a, it, it's, it's it's a free place. It's like your spot your space. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah a lot of security inside that bubble. Yeah. A lot of security, and it's the only place you can be loud without anyone hearing you. You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. can listen to music yeah. loud, you can talk loud, you can, uh, and you're just this moving space you own. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It is it's a very interesting phenomena. It's both very public and visible, you know, but at the same time it's right. it's, a, it's very sort of private and isolated. And I'm yeah, I'm being I'm hearing a little echo of my own voice, so maybe that's just my phone. I hope so. Fuck, I don't know. We're just going <laughs> to record it and hopefully it works. Okay. Uh not all like change the services they use or something, but uh, I think I think we're all right. I don't hear any echoes. Okay. But uh, yeah, so my guest today is Bernard McGrain. He is a professor at Chapman University. My alma mater, alma mater is a alma mater. How do you say it? Alma mater. Alma mater. What is it? I think it's alma mater. My alma mater. Because I got okay. a, you know, New York, sometimes so, yeah. I, my New York City accent comes out, so I'm not sure, but I think it's alma messes mater. Messes up your Latin. <laughs> <laughs> it all messes up everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it Latin that they use? Uh, you know? Well, I, in terms of, uh, you know, I guess Western civilization. For like, for like university Greek and related shit. Yeah, Greek and Latin. Greek and Latin, huh? Yeah, that was, uh, you know, kind of the fundamental uh, script. The fundamental language that almost all the, you know, the knowledge, the books, and everything was sort of preserved in, and it, it actually had a long staying power, you know, thousands of years. Hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty good run. So it's like a thro- it's like a throwback to uh, to the to the beginning of it all. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, most in terms oh. of our education, you know, most. Uh, you know, I don't know, well-educated, but, you know, educated people for centuries. You know, definitely part of the education was learning Latin and learning Greek and then, uh, you know, yeah. u- using those languages. I mean, you know, the Pope just came here and uh, his English isn't too hot, but, you know, he's got a lot of Latin under him as well as his Spanish. Right. Pretty good for a Pope. I thought it was pretty solid. Oh, like, yeah. Uh, no, you I know, mean, he, everybody he wrote it all out, but... I, but, you know, you understand him. Oh, sure, sure. You would yeah. think that, I mean, I don't want to poke holes in, in the church, but, uh, you know, I, I just feel like if you were the voice of God, you should be able to speak every language, right? I mean, God would, I would think he'd be like, here's all the languages, <laughs> you know? I don't think it quite you works need, like, that a, way. <laughs> doesn't quite, not, like... That was too much to ask, but <laughs> all all Catholic jokes aside, I do love this Pope. I think he's um he's like uniting the world. Really, he he seems like he's being a leader when there's a vacuum of good leadership. You know? No, sure. No, I I agree definitely. I mean, everyone that I know that watches I'll- it, I love that guy. You know. Uh, well, the, one yeah. of the most telling comments I heard was some someone f- from San Diego who um, she was given the offer and she took it to fly all the way to wherever, I guess, I think it was either Philadelphia or Washington, in order to be, you know, yeah, she had to be in his present. And she said, um, right. I've been a Catholic for it? like 45 years, and for all the other popes, she said, I, you know, I don't think I'd cross the street to go see them, but... I would go right, across right. the country to see him because he he resonates kindness and spirituality, and right. uh, you know that sort of hit it you know right on the head. His uh, he's not a he's not a political figure. He's he's a leader, like you said, and uh, he's uh, deeply spiritual. Yeah, and he's taken steps to modernize the church. I think that's why everyone likes him because. I'm Catholic because like once you become Catholic, it's it's like permanent. So <laughs> yes. you, you can't un you can't un you know no, confirm you can't yourself. Which is, no, you can't unlearn. <laughs> which I liked. I liked it when I got. I've been baptized. I think. Tw- how many times have I been baptized? At least twice. So like I was. Mm-hmm. I think I was baptized as a baby. I got yeah. baptized when I was a teenager in like a non-denominational church, and then. You know, like, kind of towards the end of high school, I got really into this movie called Boondock Saints. My brother and I uh, Mm -hmm. kind of got into our Catholicism. 
and uh, you know we we got confirmed officially because we hadn't done that before. Mm-hmm. And so I have my bases covered. You know, I'm I'm like totally. I just wanted to make sure I was fully, like insurance wise, I was covered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I'm so glad well, I did it just in case. Like it's true. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, like my my name's on the list just in case. Uh, the, the stuff I think is silly turns out to be the case. Like, you, sorry, Nico, that's not gonna work. You gotta, huh? No, it does work though. Uh, <laughs> based on like, what most Christians say, the, it does work. Like you can't, because because you're like permanently forgiven. So it's like it, it doesn't matter what happens from that point. I mean, people would there's there's different arguments, but for the most part, people believe that like once you take that step, you're you're all set. Like no matter what you do, you take you're, what uh, step? you're covered. You're on the list. Okay, why don't you take what so, step? Uh, y- well, okay. So the, if you're not Catholic, most Christians believe you accept Jesus into your heart, mm-hmm. which I don't know how you measure that. Uh, it seems like you're just like I accept. You know, it, it, it's like an emotional thing, I guess. Sure. I don't know. Oh yeah. But yeah. the. You know, when people say that, then most modern Christians say that that's all. You don't even need the ceremony. Like, you just say that and you're set. Um, Catholics, you, you pretty much need the uh, you need to get the baptism. Uh, there's probably, like, an appeals process if you had one scheduled and died in the meantime. Or I imagine there's, like, some purgatory attorneys who can process some paperwork. And so... <laughs> still get you in and and under you know mitigating circumstances would i'm I'm sure be taken into consideration but you know they believe for for the most part like once you do that uh you're you're forgiven forever and which is a really good deal and it's kind of like um i feel like just as someone who works in sales now Mm -hmm. it reminds me of this conversation is kind of going all over this is one we're planning on talking about but it reminds me of these kind of scams that they, that people would do via email and stuff where it's one of those things where you're you're like 90% sure it's bullshit but if it is true it's such a good deal that it's like worth wasting the 100 bucks or whatever it, it's like that kind of famous Nigerian king email scam you know where they're oh, yeah. like yeah Oh, you know, our our king's like uh, imprisoned right now, and he just needs some like you to front him like twenty bucks so he can uh, pay his bail, and as soon as he gets back, he's gonna give you like a million dollars, or because that's like nothing to him, or you know, some some weird story like that. But the mm-hmm. upside mm-hmm. is so huge that it's like I just you know I just spent a hundred bucks on these, you know these sneakers I don't even like like. It, it's worth it. And it's worth taking a shot, you know. So, so if you get enough people to use that reasoning, that money can really add up, and that's that's how those scams work, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think religion, because what's that famous argument? There's a really famous. Um, you just know, laid out Thomas Pascal. Aquinas. Well, what you just laid out was Pascal's Pascal. wager. Yeah, that's what you just did. Yeah. That's it. In terms of the value. If you if you adhere to this faith at death, two things will happen. Either you will have eternal life in you know, in paradise, or you will be absolutely nothing. And you won't even remember the wager or anything else. So really in a sense you have nothing to lose and you have, you know, eternity to gain. And that's a that's a deal closer right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard to argue from a like worried about yourself standpoint you know <laughs> but uh i but I would the, argue see i always thought it was bullshit though because i thought pascal's wager was bullshit in that for one i think your intention should matter where yeah, you know uh, otherwise everyone's gonna say yeah okay i accept jesus in my heart like why wouldn't you mm-hmm. you know so that that's why i think but i also think it's bullshit in that it presumes two options when really there's an infinite possibility. Yes, and it also assumes a kind of ultimate uh, selfishness. I'm doing this yes. for my own soul. 
Um, exactly. You know, and, uh, and Which I think, defeats the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you get a good sense of that from the Pope that, you know, that like I said, it sort of resonates the spirituality. Is You know, he's not thinking too much about himself. He's just... Um, you know, whatever needs to be done politically that he can do. And, and you know, kind of, there's a generosity of spirit in there that's just palpable. Yes. Yes, and he's not trying to sell you on a religion or condemn you for right. something you do. You know, he, right. he's not embodying the stereotypical Catholic principles, of, you know, just making you feel guilty, making you feel like if you don't belong to this club, like you're fucked. He's he's just uh, there's kindness, he's embodying there's something yeah. completely different. Yeah, there's genuine kindness there, genuine kindness, and you know, and and at least that's what I you know sensed and felt and heard, genuine kindness and generosity, and yeah, the, without any of the sort of you know, there's such a long heritage of the legal dimension. You know, you have to do this or this happens, or right. you know, the punishment dimension and the fear dimension all that is sort of gone and and the law dimension that's like all gone it's just uh kindness um so it's, yeah and that's yeah. universal like that transcends religion just that understanding that it's like a i feel like that's just a core thing we understand and when we feel that and when we sense it and it's genuine yeah, yeah. that that's the way it's supposed to be and and you know, let the chips fall where they may. If if that's how you're, I don't know, if that's how you're living your life, then I don't think there's a single person in the world that would say uh, you're going to be tortured forever because you didn't <laughs> join the right. You know, it makes no sense. No, there like are people that will really say that. But... <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it, they won't, re- they wouldn't really believe it. Like, even those West Correct. Row Baptist right. Church guys, like, if you put them face-to-face with someone who's genuinely kind, like a Dalai mm-hmm. Lama or whatever, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that they're, they're maybe they'll keep up appearances and keep saying the same thing, but I, I really don't think they'd believe that any god would would uh, condemn someone who's just provably good. Sure. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, I'll, let's hone it in a little and, and talk yeah. about what I originally contacted you to talk about. So our topic today is going to relate to the Syrian refugee crisis, which by now I'm sure everyone listening is aware of. Mm-hmm. Okay. To to uh, summarize what's going on, just in case someone's not aware, uh, it's a very complex issue, but what happened was basically there's a huge civil war in Syria. Uh, the government led by Assad is fighting and has been for years fighting different rebel forces ranging from like Al Qaeda to ISIS to who knows. And there's just this terrible civil war, with all these people vying for power and it's destroyed the country. So all of these people who escaped death or induction into an army they didn't want to fight for or what have you, they're, they fled basically. And now, I guess enough time's passed that they're reaching Europe and reaching these different countries, and they need somewhere to live if they don't have a home. Uh, yeah. So imagine, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of homeless people walking towards your country. And now it's really a, a test of character for these different countries uh, to say... Will you take care of these people? Will you kick them out? Will you let them pass? Will you, you know, it it goes back to these ancient ideas revolving around borders and ownership Mm. of land and Mm. culture. And uh, you are with us. You're not allowed to be a part of what we are. You're, you know, and you hear Donald Trump embodying that kind of, I don't know if you'd want to call it a value, but that commitment to the would hegemonic be the right word you know like that just this we have a culture you're not allowed to be a part of it you're a problem that we don't have time for that's kind of the message he's sending with all the immigrant talk and that's what you're seeing actually in practice 
from a lot of European leaders where they're just not letting these Syrian people come to their country. Yeah, I think. And so we're we're going to discuss that. And I, I reached out to uh, Professor McGrain because he's my favorite professor I've ever had still. And um, he taught a class. Do you still teach that class? The the death self and society that one or yes yes I do why don't you tell them what that class is well uh, sort of like what the title says death <laughs> self and society <laughs> all right so I'm gonna... um, yeah the first the first seg you know it's, I have sort of different segments to it there's sort of a whole logic of development and um, the first section is a sort of existential dimension, uh, encountering mm -hmm. probably the most difficult of all dimensions, my own death, to really come up against the truth of my own death, my mortality, you know, that I, that I will die. And it's very, very, very difficult to access that, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's actually one of the ancient sort of sayings in the Eastern world is, you know, it's the greatest miracle on earth is a, a human being can look around and see all his ancient relatives have died, people that he's known has died, you know, uh, previous generations have died, other people around the world are dying right now, and yep, but it's not going to happen to me, you know. Right. And that's, uh, that's a big one. It's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, layers and levels and subterranean levels of denial and yes. uh, and you know distancing from that so the first segment of the course was you know really encountering my own death and then i go into uh, we look at sort of the contemporary uh, medical situation of death and dying for you know how medicine looks at it how doctors have looked at it i use kubler rosses on death and dying there's a really good recent book by Atul Gawande. <laughs> I love his name. He's a um, he's a, a cancer specialist and a surgeon, and uh, you know it's sort of very critical about the established distancing away from death that our medicine, you know, that is a big part of the way we practice medicine. And then I look in at that, and that we just isolate people who are dying from. Society, if I remember correctly, that was kind no, of that's a, what yes, we that's, talked that's about in one, class, right? Yeah, that's one component of uh, you know isolating from others, and the other component is um, with the ideal of somehow our we you know we have this faith that our, you know well doctors can do everything today in our hospital and all we, they can do things so we've got to fight death no matter what and you know we'll take whatever right. measures we can. You know, and it turns into, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a week to have someone all hooked up. And, and you know, our medical technology is so skilled that we can keep people on sort of, you know, survival mode, you know, um, almost in suspended animation for a year on these, you know, um, intensive care wards. And this is something that's unique to our culture, correct? Uh, this, uh, yeah. This, to a degree. Uh, to this, like modern America. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, the rest of the what, world throughout history didn't feel like death is the enemy. Let's no. stay alive as long as humanly possible, you know, regardless of the cost, right? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I don't know if you remember, we we read a little thing by Philip Eries. He's a French historian, Western Attitudes Towards Death, and it's like a history of the experience yeah. of death and dying from... I don't know, roughly 1200s up till now. And it is. It's a history mm -hmm. of how we've, uh, you know, really progressed in denial <laughs> and distancing away from death. Right. You know, on one level, you know, you you definitely want, you know, medical progress, but we've kind of, it's we've lost the sense of balance with them. And in in that sense it causes tremendous amount of suffering. Uh yeah. and refusal. Uh uh, you know, so uh, the the scales have really tipped, you know, uh, in the in the denial mode, and just you know this sort of desperate belief and desperate attempt to use technology no matter what, and uh, push off death no matter what, as opposed to 
acknowledging it, making friends with death and dying, and right. allowing people um, the the truth and the dignity to sort of consciously die and be with their own dying with a level of acceptance. Uh, mm-hmm. I saw a brilliant um, documentary recently. Uh, it was called How to Die in Oregon. And, um, you know, they... You they, to die? Absolutely. I mean, they were the they were the first state that voted in. You know, the voters put it in um, a uh, a right to die, so that right if, like the voluntary uh, kind of suicide, basically like assisted suicide, right? Um, well, I I wouldn't or use that term particularly. It's more like um, I don't know, right to die. That's that's sort of how the movement. Uh, sort of, you know, politically defined itself. Right to die. Yeah. It would be really hard to get people behind that. Like. <laughs> well, how it is is pretty simple. It's, if You know, if an individual, through after all the medical stuff, in consultation with their physician, says that they do have an incurable disease and, you know, there's going to be intense suffering involved, that the, the, the doctor doesn't assist them, but the doctor writes out a simple prescription for a certain kind of uh, barbiturates or, you know, certain a certain kind of, yeah, some kind of barbiturates. And uh, it's like a prescription. And they can go to the uh, pharmacy and they get it filled and their insurance pays for it and then they have it. And if and when they wish to um, peacefully, quietly, consciously transition, they can do it. Mm-hmm. And in the documentary, you know, um, it began with one gentleman um, you know, who just took it and he lays down and all his family members are around. And some of the last things he says is, you know, I, I'm so thankful to the voters of Oregon that they've allowed me this option. And then the focus of the whole, you know, it's about an hour show, a little bit more, is uh, this one woman who's, you know, battling cancer. She's in her late 50s, I guess. And, uh, you know, she was pretty successful for a couple of years, but then it kept coming back, so she took this option. And, uh, you know, at the end, they don't show her, but you can hear her voice. They had it recorded, and she said, this is so easy. This is so easy. I wish more people right. knew about this. And then she, you know, and then she died. Yeah, it reminds me of that Woody Allen joke, uh, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> Right. Well, <laughs> that's uh, the opposite. One of my favorite. <laughs> yeah. No, Woody Allen no, jokes. That we're we're way more afraid, or we put so much more energy into our fear of a thing that maybe isn't as. Like, are you hearing like a beeping noise? Uh, you're you're checking in and out. Uh oh. In terms of like not you not being able to hear me, you mean? Uh, just uh, you know the usual cell phone stuff. You're in and out. It's okay. like you're you're traveling. Ah shit! Yeah, all this talk. We've been talking about uh, how it's okay to die. And my phone's agreeing. He's thinking it's okay to die. <laughs> um, it doesn't apply to you, phone. Uh, shit. I think. Here, I'm gonna go back inside and just check. Okay. Reception's good, but um. What was I going to say? So I was tempted to make a joke about that Oregon Trail game, everybody dying from dysentery in that game. I'm not sure what the joke was going to be. But the other thing is... Um, Tony, can you stop playing on I'm on the the show's recording. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, what was I saying? Um, wait, I'll remember. A joke? You were trying to access a joke about the Oregon Trail dysentery? Yeah, there's just there's this old computer game I remember playing as a kid where they uh, you would you you people would always die of dysentery in the computer game, but um, people will know what I'm talking about. People from my age, but uh, mm-hmm. that that's a terrible segue into something I was going to bring up. So when I, I've I've thought about death a lot, 
I think, a lot more than most people. And I've done so from a pretty young age. Like, I'm not Mm -hmm. sure a day goes by that I don't think about death, uh, my own death and uh, what that means and what I'm leaving behind and what I'm doing with my life, why I exist, you know, all these typical existential angsty type of questions. But um, I remember in class, it was on one of the first days, and I hope you still do this because it was very powerful. You you had us basically write down what our first experience with death was. Yeah, yeah. Do you still do that uh, exercise oh, in class? Yes, yes. I mean, the whole class was like crying. Um, <laughs> well, like what you said, you know, a day doesn't go by that we don't think about death and dying. And we have zero skills in terms of directly relating with the losses in our life and relating. Which do you the, think for most people they think about death on a regular basis? Because I feel like most people don't. I would say everyone does, whether consciously or unconsciously. I'm more I'm mm-hmm. more on the other end of the spectrum that we think about death and dying, you know, a couple times a minute. You know, right. have the, there's some sense of you know the um, both the impermanence of everything and the uncertainty of everything. And you right. know, one of the functions of the class is to uh, our relationship to death and dying, and that can we use death as sort of a teacher? Yes. Yeah, I think I have a different take on death because, well, I'm not, here. Here, I'll, I'll say this. So, because I need to tie this into the theme of the show, which is called tripolar. You know, bipolar stuff and the mental health angle. And, oh, okay. Uh, when, when I was I'm trying to remember how old I would have been, I was younger than fifteen, probably some somewhere between eleven and thirteen. I think was my age. Uh, I was in elementary school, and I had a friend who was murdered by his own dad. Oh my. Uh, it, which I I wrote a, a thing on in your in your class when we had that assignment and that was the first time I really tried to make sense of that and that that yeah. really came back but that made a huge impact on me cuz the dad um I mean I still remember it just being in the van we had like a van van my mom driving and she would drive over the train tracks fast whenever we did it cuz the car would kind of get a little air you know, and, and it would be, like, really fun. And uh, you see so many things that wouldn't be acceptable anymore. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, whenever there was a train track ahead, my mom would, like, pedal the metal, like, we're we're getting some air. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I remember it was pretty soon after that, you know, it was just a very positive energy. Everyone was having a great time. And, and uh, then my mom gets a call, and she's talking on the phone with, with uh, her friend uh it was like her best friend her name's Lavon and she just starts saying no and you know like kind of crying and and mm, just mm. immediately like you knew something was wrong yeah. and she wouldn't like say what happened and i didn't find out till basically later that night when i was eavesdropping on my parents reading uh, I think they were, I think it was the same night, like reading a newspaper article and, and hearing that this kid I went to school with, one of my friends from school, uh, along with his, it was a, at least, I think it was two other kids and there was a baby that I believe survived and the dad just shot up his family and his wife, too, like just killed everybody and he oh. thought that like God was telling him to do it through the TV and uh my mom told me that he uh he was sick in the head and he had uh once I, I just remember hearing that, hearing them talk about it and uh just my feet going cold and just my just like kind of trembling and just uh, imagining that because Hello? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you now. 
My phone you, died. Yeah. My phone right. ironically died. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to just pick up where I left off at. Ter- were, terrible time for it to drop out. But, um, yeah, so I just I remember hearing them read that newspaper article in the kitchen, and I was up in their room just kind of spying, and I heard them read a part about how my friend, his name is Jared Wood, was shot in the back with a hunting rifle while he was running away from the house. And so when I heard that and I just saw this image of, you know, him running through a field and just terrified and then just getting hit with a bullet, like, uh, it it was terrifying. And sure, sure. Traumatizing. I felt, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, I felt my feet go cold, my hands go cold, like I just, I was like trembling, you know, and yeah. that night I had a dream that he was, he was there, like he came into my room and uh, I saw him there and, and then like, I, I, I don't know, I, it was just uh, really terrifying and I found out that he, the explanation for it that was given was that he was had a mental disorder. Uh, he thought that he uh, was being instructed to kill his family by God through, like, the TV. Um, and uh, that he had something called bipolar disorder, and he was on medications for it, but he stopped taking his medications, and uh, he thought he didn't need them anymore. My mom was saying people with that, kind of problem you know they they stop taking their their medicine and they think that they don't need it anymore and you know Mm -hmm. sometimes they they do crazy things and so to me the worst thing that you could possibly be is bipolar you know and sure i i I never knew until like the other year i was officially diagnosed with bipolar disorder but I don't know, maybe I was subconsciously denying it for for a long time that like that was just my greatest fear was always just that maybe there was something wrong with me like that and cuz I would have weird thoughts and feelings and you know just I just knew there was something weird about me and and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to to find out that uh I I guess it happened at an age when I found out where I could cope with it, but to me, that was like the worst thing you could be, you know? Hmm. Um, And so I don't know like how exactly that informed my view of death, but I mean, the the takeaway from it that I would say is like a positive takeaway was that from a very young age, I appreciated what it meant to be alive. and, And I saw the randomness of, the world uh, where yeah 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 this was a good kid he was a christian he was a nice guy you know and i i just i remember thinking of his friend his name was paul that they left on bad terms i mean he died when they were on bad terms they were best friends and he said he hated him over some dumb shit and i remember thinking about that but i don't i don't know like i i just uh that that made such an impression where i realized that no one's above death, you know. Yes. Uh, it's it's a trigger away for anyone and sure. at any sure. time, and that's and that's just death that we inflict on one another. That doesn't account for nature and for disease and all the various ways that we, we can die. So I don't know. Like I I had a I feel like a a, a more in depth appreciation for my own mortality than. It may have otherwise had if I hadn't had a kid murdered like that when I was a kid. Um, well, I think actually that's a very um, valuable insight uh, yeah. and a shift in your relationship towards towards you know mortality and impermanence. It's it's when you know our relationship to death becomes a teacher and vitalizes our relationship to life. You know, because that's you know one of the sort of mottos mm-hmm. within a lot of the Eastern traditions as well. Death is the best mirror we have to see the truth of life, mm-hmm. and it's 
that is, uh, you know, essentially uh, our most powerful teacher. And when we forget it, um, you know, it somehow uh, affects our relationship to the vividness of life and, 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 you know, our gratitude towards life and our appreciation towards life. And when we remember it, that enhances our gratitude, our appreciation, our vividness. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And when you're confronted with, you hear from people all the time, I mean, everyone listening probably has either had a near-death experience or knows someone who has. And it's very apparent that when someone goes through a near-death experience, it it, it changes their perspective on life. Uh, yeah. Necessarily. Yes, I mean, there's no way to escape it. Like, they come out of that a different person. I think so. I think so. And that's because they're and all the all the reality. versions of that. Mm-hmm. You know all, all the, um, you know all the what shall I put? Uh, you know the the miniature near death experiences, like what you had when you were a child and you heard about your mm-hmm. child, your friend, you know being being killed. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know any near death experience, just, you know if we tune into it, helps us transform, and uh, and wake up a little bit more. Yeah, and it makes us more compassionate, I think, when we're when yes. we appreciate that mortality and that's how this ties into the Syrian thing. There's a picture that went viral of uh, everyone listening to this is probably tech savvy enough to look at the internet, you've probably seen it. There's a a, a guy holding a dead baby that washed oh, up on the I, floor. Yes. You I know heard what I mean? Yes, yes. You haven't seen it. Well, I haven't seen the photo, no, but I heard it discussed quite a bit, you know, in the radio and NPR. Yeah, it was and, it's uh, just a visceral image. And, yeah, uh, and like one it, woman said, one commentator was very sharp, I thought. She said, um, you know, hearing about or seeing thousands of people die, you know, it's like, mm, yeah, uh, one person, to see one exactly. person. That and that's what I wanted effect. to talk about, is exactly that, because... Um, all of a sudden, Americans care about this crisis. And this has been going on for like half a decade, and we don't yeah. give a shit about it. You know, like we, we kind of like hear blurbs. Like, like you said, we hear statistics, you know, mm-hmm. half mm-hmm. a million dead. Or, you know, it, I think it, it's either Lenin or Stalin is credited with saying uh, one man's death is a tragedy, a million men's death is a statistic. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's how it is. And, and it's a bizarre phenomenon. <laughs> that we can be so educated and so, uh, you know, we would think aware of what's going on and how to interpret reality. And we hear about all this pain and all this suffering, but we have to see it in a way that's comfortable enough where it's not graphic. Like, because no one would look at that picture if the baby's, like, head was cut off. Or, you know what I mean? Like, that picture would have never surfaced if it was too graphic. But it's just graphic enough that that it, it circulates, and that, that you can look at it and feel that pain and empathy and and confusion and and confliction. You, you can feel all that without being terrified, because most Americans never. I mean, we're it's we have such a weird relationship with death in America because we it's like we celebrate it with all this violent, you know, video games and movies and TV shows. And we grow up just inundated with Yeah, cinematic and, and pretend death. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, and it's like yeah. cool and it's fun and it's, you know, the good guy kills the bad guys. And right. that's right. just something we're very comfortable with. But at the same time, we don't actually see it and we don't actually understand it. Because in the movies, the guy gets shot, he's dead. He doesn't right. bleed out. He doesn't go to the hospital and... You know, you don't see his kids grow up without a dad. Or like, you know, like we just have a very cartoonish understanding of it, I feel like, until something happens where we're forced to confront it. And we, we keep ourselves in these bubbles. And it's it's something like it, it, an image like that can bridge that bubble. It's like it, it's, yeah. it's like yeah. the perfect conduit to make us appreciate that kind of suffering that we would otherwise just not care about. We'd rather hear about what, you know, Kim Kardashian did. Yeah. (laughs) 
Well, I think you know, with the with the one child and the one photo, there's a um, a moment of sort of a deep identification. Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. it's re death is real, you know. Right, death is real because uh, we like unreal death. You know, that's fine, that's entertaining. But if it's one person, and one of the commentators said, and by the way, this is a, a, a white person, a young white mm -hmm. child. So that that you know somehow um, you know has a greater uh, access to our you know emotional resonance tones. So uh, yes, it does. It hits of course, us and we recognize it, and and then it has an effect. You know, I think somewhat similar thing happened when they uh, the guy shot the lion, and that went viral. And yeah, you know, there was yeah. such a, it was the same thing. Was this is one. Gorgeous, beautiful lion, and you know, uh, you know, people started. Well, and we care about lions, all of a sudden. Yeah, right. It's uh, so that that phenomena of you know, it has to be, or it doesn't have to be, but it's much more effective when it's just one. And there's something about deep emotional identification that mm -hmm. seems to be necessary. So it's a deep feeling. Uh, then it becomes real. Other than that, it, right. you know, it is. It's like a statistic, which means it's a concept, and I can rationally understand it, and you know, uh, and that's fine. It's and just that's data. Just, uh, yeah, data, and and on, you know, on, uh, relating to it on the level of understanding. You know, certain yeah, and, and human beings are still emotional creatures. We we trained ourselves to think. We try to make decisions based on rationality and logic and all this, but we don't act unless it's an emotional decision uh, when it comes to anything drastic, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it has to be rooted in, you know, uh, an emotional and an emotional dimension, for sure. And a lot of people, I think their sense of empathy isn't enough to feel that emotion necessary to do something or at least care unless it's packaged in a way that's, Highly accessible, like that picture. Yeah, yeah. I remember when um, there were a lot of discussion and photos of uh, one of the journalists being beheaded by ISIS, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. put on the internet. And I was really curious, so I asked uh, a couple of my classes, "How many of you have, you know, actually watched this on the internet?" And no hands went up. Just one, one person, and he was, you know, he was mm -hmm. an ex-marine. Um, wow, but everyone, you know, and I remember, you know, hearing all the discussions about it and realizing, um, like what you just said, it, ha you know, that's beyond. Well, and uh, it's the very threshold. hard to find. It's very hard to see. Uh, yeah, but for, that's a great example because everyone hears about it. You see like snippets of it in the news, and then, but if you actually wanted to see it, you can't. And it's a question of why is it that you're not allowed to see it? Is that obviously it's a terrible thing, but it's a it's a thing that matters. And why is it that you don't even have the option unless you you know, go to some really weird website or it was the same thing with the video where they burned the guy the pilot captured oh, that, right, right, in that right. cage. Like I actually watched that video, I found it. I watched uh -huh. the whole thing. I, I like made my watch it because I wanted to appreciate what's actually going on in the world, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're very good at what we just talked about. They're very good at sending emotional, creating emotional experience with an execution. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. symbolic. It's they, in the same attire that that we put our Guantanamo Bay prisoners in, a, you know, it's just really well produced as a as a. It's so weird about it was that. Nico, I'm sorry, we're I, you're breaking up on me. Yeah, I'm gonna go back outside. I think we're having better reception there. Okay, going back to the car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What I was saying was in regards to the ISIS video mm -hmm. where they burn that pilot to death. Right, right. When I was watching it, 
it was something I'd never seen because it was real, but it yes. felt fake because it was so well produced. And oh, in terms of editing and cuts and zooms, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and just the yeah, just the way it was laid out, like it it, it felt like a movie, you know. And yeah. I'd never seen something so primitive produced in such a, uh, you know, it, it's like a Chapman student made it, you know, like it or better. Yeah. And right. so it was a cognitive dissonance I felt mm-hmm. because you know there was music, there was uh, everything was laid out in a way that symbolized something. There was there was a lot to it. So it was it was like art. You know, they were consciously creating something designed to evoke an emotion mm-hmm. and to be pretty much probably just to be a recruitment tool and to be a message to the West to, uh, you know, don't fuck with us is pretty much the takeaway. And sure, sure. And at the end, I think they gave like names or addresses of other like pilots. And, you know, it was very scary what they did. And, and, so there are people who, whoever made that, that's someone who understands this kind of phenomenon I'm talking about, this uh, this idea that we have to experience something a specific way for it to make a lasting impression on us if we're not directly encountering it in real life. You know, yeah. if it's not a yeah. near-death experience, it has to be tailored in, in a very specific way to make someone feel something very close to that if they hmm. really were there. And um, that's what artists do, I think. And that's the value and danger of a good artist is they're able to manipulate human emotion in a very conscious way. That's what I, I mean, that's what I do. That's my job is to write things in a, in a way and, and, and show people my vision for how, to create a story in a way that it it pulls those strings and it Mm -hmm. makes you feel those. So it's a very, being a screenwriter is weird because you're you're a very manipulative, manipulative uh, creature. I mean, your job is to, to create something imaginary and, and design it so that it evokes specific emotions. Uh, Everything they say, what they're wearing, what music's playing, the way it's shot, the way, you know, th- just every detail is designed to manipulate you emotionally. And it, it says something about our culture that we value that so much. And I think rightfully so. It's interesting to me that we really value good filmmaking and that we go, we go to the movies, that we pay money to go watch channel narrative that we know didn't really happen. Yes. But it, but it's like the artists behind it are trying to sit, make us experience something, and we really value that to the point where we have cinemas, you know, giant buildings all over the country where, and hundreds of millions of dollars are spent to create these experiences, and and it's universal that people really enjoy and and appreciate having that. So. I don't know exactly where I'm just, going with that, but okay, no, I, uh, <laughs> I we may have touched <laughs> this once before, but it's and it's not just in the United States. This is a global experience. The power Absolutely. of cinema, you know, as an art form, it is the most powerful art form that has ever existed on the planet. It, it's sure. beyond novels, beyond opera, beyond painting. And one understanding of it or one interpretation of the power of it is that its roots are fundamentally in our relationship to dreams. Because a mm. you know, a great film is recreated like a dream. And in mm. dreams everything you know, that evokes emotions. Uh, I mean uh, uh, the whole spectrum is right there. And and as well waking up from the dream you know the dream is over so it's a you know a very very uh, immersive Im- intensely immersive experience to watch a film as it is to have a dream it's connecting with you on a subconscious level uh, subconscious pre-conscious you know and then you know possibly conscious as well you know in terms of being an artist uh, you know 
you you have to be aware of you know all the techniques that you got to use and how you're going to evoke this stuff. So yeah, it, it's a holistic uh, whatever the ecology of consciousness. It hits every level of it, hmm. and it does. And it speaks. It speaks uh, you know an emotional language and an image language. What do you mean by the ecology? Uh, the ecology of, I don't know, just, uh, you know, when you say unconscious, well, you know, th- th- that's one level, but there are other levels. Uh, you know, it's not it's not just unconscious. There's pre-consciousness, and there's like sub- subconscious levels. Well, how would you define pre-conscious? I, I'm just curious because I haven't heard that term used. I think I know what you mean, but what what is pre-consciousness? Um just envision a kind of shading off from clear articulate images to you know a little bit more fuzzy to uh, a little bit more uh watery down to you know the clarity of the water gets opaque and then down into the mud underneath the water uh, that's what i meant by the ecology the the multi levels of the consciousness mm. And, you know, we have this sort of same experience in our dreams. And, you know, I'm so sort of I've been intrigued by our relationship with dreaming, which, you know, in the end, oh, with, the Tibet, with the Tibetans, all this sort of is seen as also associated with uh, with death and dying. Because, you know, how, in a very How do they ancient, in, interpret dreams, the Tibetans? Well, uh, I don't know, interpret. Because um, we dismiss them as, fancies we have in the night you know we i think in western culture we kind of i've always been so fascinated by dreams because part of my condition or whatever's you know the way i'm wired i would i would snap into episodes where i felt like i was dreaming but i was conscious Mm -hmm. i knew i was awake but i felt like i was dreaming yeah, and it would yeah. really fuck with me, and 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 likewise when I'm dreaming, sometimes I I I, I lucid dream, you know, and I, I've had that since I was younger. But uh, oh, are you? Okay, I've been working on that lately, lucid dreaming. That's oh, very really? interesting. Yeah, actually, I did a whole workshop in uh, this place. You know, it's a Tibetan American center in Colorado, and one of the teachers is, uh, uh, you know, part of what he's teaching and transmitting is, you know, pretty ancient Tibetan stuff, which is, uh, our re- first of all, the closest we, one of the ancient analogies with death is sleep, okay? Yes. So, insofar as we investigate sleep, we're in some sense also investigating death. And our relationship with uh, conscious waking life and then that, that slow transition into sleep And that dreamless sleep, as well as dreaming, as well as lucid dreaming, these are all different sort of manifestations of mind, manifestations of our being. And to, um, you know, really uh, be open and inquisitive to that area. And lucid dreaming uh, is a very... uh, uh, it's pretty. It sounds like you know some people are just born like what you just said. You know, with a good facility towards it, and right. uh, it that uh, that's fantastic. It can be learned. It's been done. You know, Stephen LeBurge in, in Stanford has you know set up a dream laboratory, and so a lot of scientific work has been done with this. And it, it is a psychological and you know to some degree spiritual tool. Lucid right. dreaming. Except you have to sort of transcend the uh, entertainment dimension of it. This is, you know, given a kind of Tibetan interest in spirituality and enlightenment. That uh, because if you your facility with lucid dreaming, you can fly, you know, you can go wherever you want, you can have sex and all. So it's like the ultimate home entertainment center at some level. But at right. the end, you know, that sort of you know leaves one sort of okay, you know, what else? And that is a tran- that can be a transition from lucid dreaming to dream yoga. That's where the relationship to dreams takes on a little bit more uh, spiritual component, uh, a kind of evolution of consciousness component, where you can actually learn more deeply the no- the notion of uh, meditation and an enlightened mind within dream yoga. And then possibly you can evolve into what's called a sleep yoga, where 
you, uh, in some sense, instead of just blacking out, which most of us do at night, black out, that there is some some um, awareness that is still maintained throughout that dreamless sleep state without mm. waking up. And uh, right. uh, you know, his phrase is, you know, the Buddha never sleeps. I mean, yes, you know, Buddha's rest and all this other stuff, but they're, they're 24 hours um, on, if you will. Right, they're Walmarts. And, <laughs> and that that uh, that familiarity with those states of mind is very beneficial when it's time to die. That instead of right. you know, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when I want to be there when it happens. I want to be there uh-huh. when I transition into sleep. Uh, there's some sense, you know, at least within this tradition of if you if you can, some sense accomplish that, you can be of great benefit to yourself and to others in terms of ridding us of all this fear that we have all the time. And, uh, you know, as I said, making friends with death and dying. Um, yeah. Because who knows, uh, the the reason why, one of the reasons why we're so afraid of death is it's the unknown. And right. one of the things about dreams is they're real. Inside them, they are real. They are absolutely real. And then we wake up. Oh, and the only reason we see them as dreams is because we wake up and we have this consciousness that we share with each other. And we can look back in contrast and say, oh, it was just a dream. I like that someone else has said that because I've I've felt that you just said 100%. And I, I have so much compassion for people who are not sane because... Yes. To then, imagine being in a dream you don't wake up from. It doesn't yes. matter what's going on outside that dream. It doesn't right. matter what everyone else says is real. If to you that's reality, that's reality. I mean, what we experience is reality. If someone were to come and tell us, hey, you're in the Matrix, like that, okay, so what? I still got, you know, what, <laughs> we, what, is, what does that mean? So what? Right. You know, this is right. what I experience. This is, unless there's some way out of here... This is it. This is and so when someone's insane, like to just dismiss them as insane, it really bothers me. Especially when there's people commit acts like this guy did, where he killed his family, sure. and yeah. and when they just say he was crazy, and like okay, but that's it. That's the end of the investigation. You right. know, the, right. no. What was he experiencing? Why did he think that was the thing to do? Because obviously he really believed it. And is that is we just need to understand what that is and and where that's coming from and and because most people have never experienced anything like that and hopefully never will. But if you're in a position where your sanity is called into question mm-hmm. and your experience of reality is is lucid, like you're in a dream, mm-hmm. that's uh, that's terrifying and dangerous. And at the same time. I think, key to our evolution, understanding Hmm. these things you're talking about that we don't even really get this, uh, you know, like like Marcus Aurelius, he's my favorite Hmm. emperor. Uh, I I read his book when I was in like high school. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it was just called The Meditations. The Meditations, yeah. Yeah. And, And that's when I first really started uh, identifying with this idea that you brought up of death and dreams being interlinked because he would say from the dream of life to the dream of sleep is like something he would always say. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, whoa, you know, he, like, he, yeah, he sees like dreams as like he doesn't see this line between here's what's real and here's what's not. It's like right, life is right. a dream to the dream, and and my I wrote a script. It's my favorite thing I ever wrote. Interesting. And yeah. it's right now. It's um. It it made the top five percent of something called the Nickel Fellowship, which is like the World mm-hmm. Series of screenwriting competitions. Oh, and great. Yeah, and I have people reading it right now. That uh, you know, some executives and eight and uh, managers and. I'm hoping something happens with it. Everyone's going to say it's too violent, it's too controversial, no one's going to want to make it. But and it, it's dope on these themes we're discussing. And it's about a guy who dreams he's, it, he's 
in places the the okay so he dreams he's in a different place in time uh where uh-huh. something terrible happened but okay. he knows what's about to happen so he's in a position to to change it and mm-hmm. then when he wakes up history's been changed based on what he did in his dreams so oh, okay. to him there is no dream you know it's it's just time travel and the, it, he's drawn it, there's a sort of destiny he's kind of pushed towards to confront something about his own past as the uh, ramifications of the things he's changed in the past come to collide with his what we would call reality you know his waking life and yeah, right, right. i used real tragedies in the movie uh like columbine these things people don't really know about real like shootings and and mm-hmm. because i mm-hmm. wanted people's experience i wanted the movie to say i wanted it to hit home i wanted people to 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 merge this line they draw between real and fake. You know how between, before every movie it'll be like, you know, any characterizations are purely coincidental and there's nothing oh, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> I'm like, well, why are you such a pussy? Like, why? Are you, what are you afraid of that someone mistakes it for reality? Like, why is that line? And, and I wrote, I think I took it out because I knew that people read this, that you're not going to, that's why everyone said that, oh, it's great, but it's too controversial. But, I wrote the very first thing before the movie starts is that all the characters in this movie are real, basically. Or, you know, you know, there was like the opposite of a disclaimer where it said everything's as accurate as possible for, for the real tragedies that occurred. And I, I did as much okay. research as I could. I recreated these events because I wanted it to hit home for people. And it was the hardest thing I've ever written but it's the thing I'm most proud of. The, and I felt like when I finished it, I was like, okay, I could die. Like, I'm done. You know, it doesn't, I didn't. <laughs> okay, like, I could die tomorrow. I don't give a shit. Like, my job's done. But uh, That's a good feeling. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it gets made. I don't know. But, yeah, it's just this. There, there definitely is a, a line we try to draw between yes. conscious and unconscious. And when... Sure people transcend that line or blur it or explore these other variations of consciousness like I know you do and you you encourage others to do, there's a lot of kind of silent blowback for that. We don't like that as a society, I feel like, in Western culture. Yeah, I think in terms of the basic organization of ourselves, yeah, we don't. We don't. Yeah. And I, I mean, I encourage anyone listening to get into meditation. And well, I don't know, definitely meditation, things. lucid dreaming. You know, I think that those are very good um, practices to engage in. And you know, dreaming is fun, and lucid dreaming is a great deal of fun. And um, it's uh, it is also an arena for very rapid, I think, at least within the Tibetan tradition, for very rapid spiritual development. And maybe one of the uh, payoffs for this is, uh, you know, no matter how frightening or scary or painful a dream is, when we wake up, it's like, oh, okay, it was just a dream. That was just a dream. And I think that might happen when we die. Exactly. That's exactly the next step. It's like we we die. Oh, that we was wake just up. a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever happens, like, to me, it's kind of it's like an opposite of Pascal's wager, where it's like, either way, I'm not worried because either I'm going to die in this blackness, like atheists think, or, you know, like they relate it to sleep. Yeah, that's like sleep. Yeah, that's like the you know just, uh, dreamless sleep, and we just black right. out. So if that's if my consciousness just retires and that's the end of it, what? Okay, whatever. Uh, but if, if something else happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cool, you know, and I I don't I know it's not going to be like hell. I don't. I mean, the logistics of that just don't pan out. <laughs> uh, it's going to be way too hard to manage hell. I mean, it would be it just way, and God wouldn't make that. It's just it makes no sense. But I don't know what there is. I I don't. I have no idea. And that's that's what scares people is just that. Yes, not it's a knowing. Not knowing. So, it's a not knowing. So I think we insert something there. Okay, so. Um, Plato, I believe it was, is either Plato or Socrates. I was confused the two. They, they did. A, there was a quote that really stuck with me my freshman year at college, and that was, "Those who tell stories 
rule society. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, what was this guy just, you know, really being really cocky, you know, like, because he's good at, like, writing, he's a good writer, and he's just, like, talking shit, he's drunk or something, but, you know, as as I grew up, uh, I, I kind of, I feel like I'm more and more seeing what it means, because sure, sure. There's, there's this natural tendency to need to insert a narrative in certain, yes, yes. insert, it's like, the, it's like there's, like, a, like, with a gun, you have a clip you need to put in, like I feel like everyone's born and they have like it, like they need something to load in there where it explains why I exist, what I'm supposed to do, what happens when I die. And cultures have different variations of this, and a lot of times they they fall into very similar storylines. But I think that's kind of what he was referring to. And and leaders, yes. you know, they they paint these good leaders are good storytellers, yep. and that's what they do. They create a narrative that says this is the bad guy, we're the good guy, here's why. And here's what we need to do, and here's how we're going to be remembered. And, he, you know, and, and they can say whatever they want. Well, that's, you know, like with Hitler, it was he had this whole belief in this oh, Aryan yeah. race, yeah. and oh, yeah. he brainwashed Germany to believe they were the superior creatures and they needed to exterminate, you know, the inferior one. It was just like Darwinism on steroids. Mm. And yes. And and you know that's what he was good at telling stories. He was good at, and he and he took extreme steps to. I mean, he was like a he was an evil genius. You know, he he <laughs> found a way to convince an entire population that sure. they were these superior creatures, and that the, they could and were destined to take over the world and and run it. You know, and yeah. just be running shit, and yeah. and. And and you you know we're at a stage in in history where it is a statistic. You know we look back on that and it's at a point where it's like if he would have won, society would be this way. Maybe it would be better, or maybe you know it's like what happened with the Native Americans. Like the the mm. Europeans wiped them out as a complete total tragedy. Now we're just like okay, but we got a good country out of it. And like so, I feel like we're at that point in history. Enough times passed where. You know, if he'd won, if he'd lost, whatever, it's like, w- what's the better society? But the mo- the movie I was referring to that made me reach out to you was, it really turned those statistics into people for me again. And it changed my perspective on that. You know, like, being able to talk about these historical things as just, mm-hmm. like, pieces on a chessboard. You know, because that's what we do. We zoom way out, and it's just like, Oh, he invaded here, and and they won this war, and and they won this battle, and this is why they lost the war. And like we just create a story, and we that's the story. But you know, I, this guy created this movie, and he was a kid who lived through the Nazis invading these Baltic countries, and people don't really know about this or, or think about it as much as like the Jews being killed in the Holocaust. But you know, millions, millions of of. Uh, Eastern European and, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, no. Russian well, yeah. people, enormous, way more, enormous. And were, Russians, yeah. were slaughtered, just yeah. the same. And yeah. um, and it, I don't think it gets the same attention just because Jewish people are better storytellers at the end of the day. I think they're <laughs> that's their tradition. I mean, from the get-go, it's like they were really good at, at telling stories, like remembering things and creating narratives, and they created the Bible, and they create, you know... And they pass <laughs> stories along, and I think thousands of years ago, like you see that today, like I think that's why Jews run Hollywood. It's not because, like, it's just a fraternal thing. I think it's because they're good storytellers by nature. A lot of Jewish people are just good at telling stories, so that's why we hear that story more. But sure. uh, you know, the, the same thing happened to a lot of different uh, people, yes, and he yes. made this movie where he's a boy. Uh, I think he's basically recounting or just creating like a dream, basically, where we saw what his life was like or what it was like to be then and there. And mm. this movie was made years and years and years ago. It's like, I don't remember the exact date. It was like 70s, 80s, you know, maybe even early. I don't know. It was an older movie. But it is the most powerful portrayal of war I've ever seen in my life. And it, oh, wow. Oh. It doesn't show, I don't think it really shows any graphic violence. You see the aftermath 
of and, and the anticipation of and the mm. fear of just mm. these horrendous acts and just to see and and it doesn't speed up and skip it is what this movie doesn't do which is <laughs> what american movies do for the most part they're really oh, yeah. time compression like, yeah right exactly so it's like you get the idea like the guy cocks the gun cut to the next scene right. no this is you see 30 bodies outside the building that were lined up and shot and that's this kid's family and you'd see him look at it you know it's like like these images that you don't want to see and then the filmmaker he interlinked it with real footage at the end of oh, wow. like people wow. from the holocaust and like of, and this kid's like shooting a picture of Hitler after this just horrendous, horrendous few days he's been through. That where he just I can't really do it justice through words, but this this boy has become something else at the end of the movie, and you see him just shooting this picture of Hitler, and and just you're seeing his thoughts and. You're just, and then you're conceptualizing as, like, people historically look, you're seeing the war, real footage of just different phases of what's going on, big picture, and, and, and he's shooting this picture, and you're just feeling his just anger and frustration and bitterness towards this thing that consumed his world. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's so powerful. And I would, I encourage you to take a look at it maybe for your class, because it really shook me up and a movie hasn't shaken me up in a long time because I'm, I'm so familiar with the way movies are made. And that's, a lot that's of great. That's, from a, it. that's great to hear. And it's a good experience for you too. Yeah. I mean, it, since you're, you know, pro, so that's your profession, that's your field. So to actually yeah, find it was one before that's all these effects, you know, like they were really blowing up force and they were really burning things down. And there, it seemed like there were real bullets and, I mean, there's just a sense of realism to it that's right, right. menacing, and that I what? think is glossed over in today's movies. Or just, it's not really. We don't recreate the world. Like you can watch fucking Transformers; they destroy New York City, and you don't give a shit because it doesn't. <laughs> right. you know, like, it doesn't seem real at all. Like it looks real, I guess. That's how like a building would break, but you don't give a fuck because it doesn't. But you, if you watch a movie like this, it's just like, oh my god! Like you know, just you, you appreciate it, and it becomes real, or as Nico, close to what, real as it can be without actually being real. That's great. That's a good definition of the movie. Uh, and what's the name of the movie? Fuck! <laughs> I should know. Um, <laughs> I'll link to it. Uh, wait, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It's uh, it's uh, here. Let me look up the. The email I sent you originally, because I I know I said it there, and I I need to say it in the actual episode. Mm-hmm. So let me find it. Sure. Um. And it's all in uh, another language, by the way, which everyone's gonna it. hate. And no one's gonna want to watch it, but still watch it because I forgot there were subtitles. You know that's how good this movie was. Sure. Sure. All right, I mean, let me I see. Thought, so. you know, I remember showing Ikiru in our desk class. That was the uh, same deal in Japanese. Yeah, and that's a great... that That's another movie that left a huge impression on me. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, Kurosawa is uh, he's one of the greats. Yeah, and he has that other movie, um, Rashomon. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's where you see the incredible. same story from, like, four perspectives. Right. It makes you really question. Okay, I'm, find, I'm finding this email I wrote you. Come and see, it's called. And it came out in 1985. Come and see? Come and see. Okay. Come is what it translates to. Interesting. And, um, 1985, okay. 1985, so three years before I was born, this thing came out. And that to me is just amazing. And it, it speaks to the fact that a real artist can tell a story that will transcend time. Sure. You know? Sure. Because none of the technology we have today was available to him. And, and he was able to tell a story in a way that, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a great play or something where it's just, even today, if, if it's done well enough, it still carries a lot of weight. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. And and I, that's like the serious thing. It's like we we have to take it seriously. Uh, <laughs> making a joke while I say we have to take it seriously, but you know, it, it's like we're our decision and and how we choose to frame the story is is impacting a lot of people, and we can't escape the effects of it. Our decision to abstain from interacting, for better or worse, has led to the current reality that there's a lot of people need a home. And <laughs> we it's like reaching a point where we can't ignore it. And that's we're, we're seeing that with a lot of... We're seeing that with climate change, I think. There's problems that we, like we were talking about earlier... We dismiss, we ignore, we pretend don't exist outside our car, outside our bubble. But eventually they're right outside our car and they start trying to get into our bubble. And that's when it's like, we really better do something or it's too late. And storytellers you know, warn you before that happens. This reminds me of where we began this conversation in terms of distancing and denial of death. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's sort of the, you know, the root uh, metaphor, the root model. And if we can, you know, begin to not deny and distance ourselves from it, uh, you know, the problems we encounter, we'll encounter them much more quickly, more clearly, more accurately, and probably more creatively. Well, and this is why we need more people like you out there, because it's a delicate thing. It's not easy to come to that realization that death's real and to appreciate that fact and empathize with the suffering of others and be in a position to live your life in a way that is impactful and meaningful without being drowned by the reality of of something depressing. You know, like like it, it's sure. it's yeah, hard it's to not balance. be debilitated by or overwhelmed by that. And I think that's why we just ignore it because it's it's too tricky or we don't have a good way to deal with it so we just ignore it which is the wrong response or you or you get these activists who are just like shouting at you you know and you're forced right, to right, that's right. not that can be effective but that's not how we're going to create a whole culture that is in sync you know and is able to act thoughtfully and effectively to solve problems we need to kind of collectively come to terms with this I think you know? Sure. No. Uh, and that's I, why we I need agree. people like you who are sort of um, Sherpas up this mountain. or You know, <laughs> who, we need artists and we need teachers like you who can who can get people to kind of slowly let that let that percolate. Well, well put. Hey, listen, my friend, on that note, <laughs> I think I'm going to. I'm going to uh, sort of end, end our conversation for today. Go do some lucid dreaming. Um, I've been I've been working on that, you know. I would say for oh I don't know about two years now in terms, you know, all the, the stages and you know beginning with do writing you do down stuff the like like look down at your hands and or try yeah, to like yeah all the techniques, uh, you know, and have a notebook there and uh, it's uh, it's very um, I think it's very you know it's it's both fun and it's uh, enlarging and uh, you know. Um, we do sleep. We spend a lot of our life sleep and dream. And uh, I think the more, uh, yeah, the more awareness uh, you know I can bring to that, the better. The better. And they say most people don't remember the majority of their dreams, which makes no, it even vast, vast weirder. Majority, you know, and almost all the scientific studies. I mean, you know, the, the 90-minute periods of REM and all the rest of it. You know, we're just sort of at the early stages of discovering this stuff, so it's pretty exciting. In the relativity of time, where it's like you could, like our our life could be a dream. Like we could die and wake up as another guy, and like that's kind of what gave me the yeah. idea. Is that, and, yeah. and it would just be like that was a weird dream. You know, yeah. and it, it's like it's a mind fuck. But um, and it, I, when I we main, we, when we maintain a little bit of that awareness in our ordinary everyday human life, we don't get freaked out as much. It's like, oh, yes. okay, you know, and I, I can extend myself here, and I can, you know, I don't have to react because, uh, you know, this is sort of more dreamlike, so it's more playful and uh, uh, less fearful, more playful. Yeah. Well, let, let me know if you, in your lucid dreaming, you know, 
uh, training and experience. If you find a way to, well, my my brain's a dick. What my brain does is when I realize I'm dreaming and I take the controls, mm-hmm. it like hits a hits a self destruct button and I wake up like I'm about to have sure. sex with a beautiful woman because like I realize I'm dreaming. I'm like I got this. Like this is what I'm ordering. And I she'll show up and I'll like move in and then I it's like I start waking up and I'm like oh god damn yeah, you know or I'm yeah. flying and then it's just like right. no you're not allowed it's like there's <laughs> regulators there's someone there's people in my brain like no no you, you know he's taking over we we're busy like stop you're not supposed to be conscious right now we're waking you up so yeah I uh, I have your email so I'll send you a couple of. Uh... CDs and stuff uh, that you might find interesting in terms of yeah, give me a way how to, to develop override skills. those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So well, yeah, thank l- thanks so much for doing the show. I, I apologize for all the uh, technical difficulties, but no problem. Like you said, no you know, it is the cosmos. You may be saying not to record it at the time we were supposed to originally, which I'm glad because I was in a pretty like hypomanic state last time, and it would have been a <laughs> Maybe way worse show. I don't know. <laughs> I would have well, said do, do shit that like know. ended my career. <laughs> <laughs> do let me know when you, uh, you know, when you send it out there. Oh, and, for uh, sure, it'll be a few weeks, but I'll, um, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, you'll, you'll see it for sure. Yeah, and I, I, as I said, I'll send you, you know, the little stuff I have in terms of the lucid dreaming and dream yoga stuff. Yeah. And let's oh, maintain and- contact. Oh yeah, I'd love to. And do you have anything you want me to promote or um tell people about? Uh no, no nothing in particular, you know. Uh just uh be kind. You know? All right. Practice kindness <laughs> and maybe investigate lucid dreaming. <laughs> All right. I'll tell them. I'll tell them. Right, What's go. the best resource for them to do that? The lucid dreaming? Yeah, you've mentioned things before, but I'll just let you say at the end in case anyone yeah, okay. wants I, to like, I would, write some shit down or whatever. I would recommend um, there's this uh, five or six CD set. The author is Andrew Holacek. It's H-O-L-E-C-E-K, Andrew Holacek. And it's just called Dream Yoga. So he lays the whole thing out and gives a, a really good context, both scientifically and uh, sort of spiritually. That sounds yeah. great, but you're dreaming yeah. if you think people have CD players. <laughs> we got, they got to find another version. Oh, Someone well, rip that CD you, and, and put it on Pirate Bay. Yeah, oh. I, for, I'm sure it already <laughs> is. Out, you know, I'm sure it already is. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we'll link to Pirate Bay. But no, yeah, thanks so much for calling on the show. I think this has been, a, uh, hopefully everything worked. And I think we had a really good conversation that people will will hopefully uh, benefit from. I hope so, my friend. I hope so. And I'm glad you're doing this. So keep going with it. All right. I will. Thank you. And, and you had a big impact on, on me uh, as a as a thinker, you know, as, a, as an intellectual. And I want you to know that, uh, you know, wherever I take my... I don't know things academically speaking, or in trying to explore these different things. You you had a big impact on open me, opening me up to those possibilities, and, and you know, feeding my curiosity and, and just seeing uh, academia as something that's not just as boring like series of hoops you got to jump through, but it, what it should be is what you're doing, and you know, really pushing the boundaries and 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 then relating what you kind of uncover the best you can to, to, mm, mm. to future explorers, you know? Yes, good. Well, thank you very much. Mm. More to come, so onwards. Indeed. All right. Good night, All Professor. Right, okay. Good night. All right, so that concludes the, uh, the technical difficulty-laden journey of this interview with Professor Bernard McGrain, full tenured professor at Chapman University in Orange County, California. Uh, he, he's got tenure. He can say whatever the hell he wants. They can't fire him. And uh, he's one of the best professors there. So anyone listening who goes to Chapman, go 
to meet him, go in his office hours, take his class, get into the honors program. If there, I think you have to apply and do that. You got to be smart. Be smart. Get into this honors program. Take his class. If you don't get in, if I can show up anyways, he probably won't care. And um, say, I'm going here. Kiss my ass. Uh, he he's a great teacher, and and it's rare to find someone who's as committed as he is to genuinely opening your mind to something that will stay there permanently and that that is good to have received. So take his class if that's possible. And, um, yeah, feel free to contact me through the website if you want me to relay anything to him. uh, It's com. And our email is tripolarpodcast at gmail dot com. You can listen to the show on the website. You can stream it. You can download it. You can listen to it on iTunes. Uh, you can listen to it through something called Player FM on Android. Download that app. Awesome app. Uh, it's the equivalent of iTunes for Android operating systems, I would say. And um, yeah, just. Uh, I hope you hope you guys had, had a, took took something away from from this and um Philips was gonna be my sponsor i I was gonna you know push this stuff it didn't work tonight but that I want you to know that's not Philips's fault probably you should still get those headphones uh it I messed up I have some issues I need to sort out with my technological infrastructure here but Philips headphones are are awesome and uh I think you should you should get these Bluetooth bad boys uh, before they run out. All right, thank you everyone for listening, and uh, enjoy your constant journey from the dream of life to the dream of death, to the dream of dreams. To you know, you can dream it, you can do it, whatever. But bye. <laughs>